The title of my talk uh, is Guests Without Hosts on the Digital Biopolitics of Network Hospitality. I want to start by explaining the title a little bit. So in 2001, uh, Andreas Vittel proposed the concept of network sociality to describe the way social relations in the 21st century were shifting from a paradigm of community to one of networking. Inspired by that piece, I followed up in 2014 with the concept of network hospitality. Uh, to register the social and spatial logics that were emerging specifically around new hospitality exchange sites at the time, like couch surfing and Airbnb. So Vitel had identified five features of network sociality. So I proposed five features of network hospitality in parallel. And in my version, network hospitality was characterized by sharing with strangers, by a paradoxical kind of engineered randomness, by the emotional and affective qualities of feeling like a guest, by a spatial logic of pop-up assemblages, and by a society of guests without hosts. Now that phrase, guests without hosts, came from kind of an idealistic place, uh, but it has haunted me ever since, especially in this world and at this moment where, that we have come to understand as in crisis. Images of travelers stranded by disasters and pandemics, tourism workers unable to afford housing in the resort towns where they work, unwelcome strangers at the border or on the beach, the parasitic hyperconsumption of over-tourism or COVID cleared streets are all emblematic of the inhospitable hospitality of guests without hosts in this age of extremes. Today, I'm returning to the idea of guests without hosts, this time bringing the lens of biopolitics with me. Rodanti asked me to focus on cybernetics, so I'll start with a brief discussion of digital biopolitics. And then I wanna to touch on a key distinction between what we might call for the purposes of debate, coercive versus affirmative biopolitics. And if I have time, I'll conclude with a few thoughts on the vital politics of alternative forms of mobile dwelling. Now, thankfully, our colleagues have reviewed the scholarship on biopolitics and tourism and hospitality studies, so I won't go too far into it. I recommend these articles by LaPointe and Coulter and Zanelli for a systematic review and critical account of these key debates. However, I do need to say a few words about how I'm thinking about biopolitics in light of network hospitality and this idea of guests without hosts. Now, when I think of biopolitics, I think first of Foucault's notion of power's hold over life and of a particular mode of governing human bodies, human life, and human populations, not through centralized enforcement of laws, but through dispersed mechanisms like internalized norms and regulations, ideals of care and responsibility, or technologies of surveillance and the self. For Foucault, biopolitics also aligns the governance of life and bodies with the interests of the market. He writes, quote, the art of government is just the art of exercising power in the form and according to the model of the economy. Indeed, much of the literature on biopolitics and tourism and hospitality uh, focuses on the commodification of people and places, or exposes the extractive labor practices of tourism as work. Scholars have used a biopolitical analysis to reveal how the bodies of tourists and workers are controlled and optimized in settings like the hotel, the beach, the all-inclusive resort, or the campground. Digital technologies plays a, uh, play a central role in this story. Digital biopolitics can refer to the way economic value is created through the digitization of biological information, for example, cellular or molecular data, genetic code, facial recognition software, and so on, which Rosie Bredotti refers to as, quote, the political economy of biogenetic capitalism. It can refer to a datafied self whose body is coded and tracked via biometrics. And this might include embedding biodata in identity cards or passports, which makes mobile bodies visible within state surveillance and border regimes. Or it might involve wearable devices that track biodata like steps taken, 
heart rate or sleeping rhythms to allow individuals to participate in the more pleasurable regimes of self or social surveillance. Of course, all calibrated to codes of proper or profitable bodily conduct. Digital biopolitics is also related to the way platform capitalism and algorithmic governance combine to control workers embodied labor. By platform capitalism, I mean um, corporate owned digital infrastructures that facilitate the direct exchange of goods or services between users, but do not actually provide those goods or officially employ the freelance workers who do. And by algorithmic governance, I'm referring to coded decision-making operations that shape the way users interact with the platform and with each other in a seemingly infinite but actually limited number of already determined ways. The integration of platform capitalism with algorithmic governance has enabled new arrangements of work and new ways of creating value perhaps most notably with the gig economy, which includes gigs like hosting guests in your home. Tim Christians uh, uses the example of rideshare platforms like Uber and Lyft to illustrate how digital biopolitics operates in the gig economy. So at first, the platform uh, promises lucrative opportunities for entrepreneurial minded freelancers who wanna be their own bosses. But Uber drivers soon realize that even though they do not technically answer to a boss, neither are they completely free to decide when to work, which passengers to pick up, how fast to drive, or when to take a break. Instead, drivers are tethered to platforms and algorithms and devices that mine digitized information like GPS data, consumer ratings, driving speeds, and passenger demand levels to push notifications that nudge drivers to work longer, drive better, and generate more revenue, regardless of their own bodily needs or limits. Christians observes that instead of becoming appendages of the machine, as Marx observed, workers in the gig economy become an appendage of the algorithm. algorithm. And he concludes that digital biopolitics takes the logics of capitalism and the limits of human bodies to extremes, governing workers' bodies to the literal and metaphorical point of exhaustion, squeezing every ounce of labor out of an Amazon fulfillment center worker or every mile out of a Lyft driver or by supersizing an Airbnb host. This brings me back to, to my central theme about guests without hosts. So this picture of biopolitical governance doing the work of extractive capitalism is worrisome, but biopolitics is not a single story. There is a counterpoint to this gloomy prognosis for power in the form of an affirmative biopolitics that emphasizes the biopolitical as a generative form of bodily agency, resistance, or empowerment. And I wanna situate my discussion at this juncture or disjuncture of coercive and affirmative biopolitical possibilities. So in the sections that follow, I illustrate these perspectives with two scenarios of guests without hosts, the absentee superhost and the mobile neighbor to consider the digital biopolitics involved in visibilizing, self-disciplining and erasing hosts and host guest relations. Well, for anyone who is not familiar with couch surfing and Airbnb, these are online platforms where users can offer or request short-term accommodation with other users in their homes. Couch surfing came online in 2004 and facilitated hospitality encounters that were originally completely free of charge. But couch surfing's rising star was eclipsed in 2008 when Airbnb, a for-profit hospitality platform, was launched. Airbnb is now the largest online hospitality platform in the world uh, with more than 6 million short-term stay listings, more than 150 million users, and over 1 billion guest stays since its inception. According to an industry blog, Airbnb's company value in 2021 was 113 billion US dollars. I think it's closer to 80 billion today. And the company had a higher market capitalization than brand name hotel chains Marriott and Hilton put together. 
Despite the ubiquity of Airbnb in the hospitality sector, it is worth noting that Airbnb is not in the hospitality business. The company does not own or manage lodging properties, nor does it employ service providers, cleaners, or maintenance staff, hosts whom Airbnb describes as hospitality entrepreneurs, are, and who are just users of the platform, not employees, are responsible for securing, ensuring, and maintaining their own properties and for all of the tasks of communicating with, caring for, and cleaning up after guests. Behind Airbnb's success in the marketplace is a sophisticated fusion of platform capitalism and algorithmic governance. And this allows the company to minimize operational costs while maximizing profit. And the best way for a platform company like Airbnb to maximize profits is to optimize the human capital and material assets of its entrepreneurial hosts. And the ideal example of this optimization is what Airbnb calls the superhost. Superhost is a status Airbnb bestows on hosts based on digitized metrics harvested through a ratings and review interface and through surveillance of hosts' correspondence and booking calendars, like how quickly they respond to guest inquiries or how often they cancel bookings. To become their best possible hosting selves and achieve the status of Superhost, hosts must become part of uh, quote, the digital data assemblages that Airbnb uses to monitor, control, and discipline interactions on its platform, as well as to modify, privilege, or reject specific bodies and spaces. And here I'm citing from Roloff Sen and Minka's uh, article. So Airbnb hosts are urged, and this is where we see the biopolitics coming in, they're urged to embrace their entrepreneurial spirit, to present themselves as trustworthy, responsive, local and welcoming, and, quote, to commodify themselves and to reinvent themselves to remain a fresh, appealing, sellable item. This quote from Stella Pennell. Despite the biopolitical discipline implicit in these algorithmic interfaces, hosts willingly participate, for the most part, willingly um, participate in these data assemblages, not just because Airbnb requires it, but because the advice Airbnb offers aligns with the entrepreneurial aspirations hosts have by now internalized. So we see how this digital discipline makes the host's body and biography visible online, but what about guests without hosts? I argue that these same digital biopolitical techniques that make the host body available simultaneously erase it in a number of ways. So one of the ways this absence happens is through the framing of hosts as micro entrepreneurs and the home as an investment. As part of its 2016 Belong Anywhere advertising campaign, Airbnb ran a series of print ads showing hosts out enjoying life with captions like, my spare room funds my travel bug, my spare room funds my expeditions, or our home funds our nonstop adventures. And in these ads, there is no sign of who might be hosting these hosts. And we can presume that wherever these roaming hosts are, they are not at home looking after paying guests. Hosts also disappear behind innovations in property management technologies. So with online booking and rating tools, automated keys and surveillance systems, and then directions and key codes provided through the platform, homeowners, who in some cases may actually be property managers fronting for speculator landlords, uh, can host their guests without ever meeting them in person. Another way hosts disappear from the hospitality equation is in what Rolofsen and Minka describe as Airbnb's implicit promise of, quote, a temporary becoming the other. This promise requires hosts to offer a local experience, but also to depersonalize and standardize their domestic spaces so that guests can easily occupy those spaces as if they, the guests, were at home anywhere. Hosts must make themselves as indistinguishable and inoffensive 
and fungible as the identical IKEA coffee mugs we see in the digital photos of their indistinguishable homes. Any host who qualifies as a superhost is, by definition, just like any other superhost, despite promises of unique experiences and local authenticity. This paradox of the unique but uniform hospitality encounter relates to Stella Pennell's argument that Airbnb hosts must avow and disavow their bodies. The hosts she interviewed in New Zealand lived on site and shared their domestic space with guests, all the while navigating an internalized obligation to be both invisible and available. The host's bodies are avowed as part of the package displayed online, but in the hospitality encounter itself, Pennell observes that hosts must, quote, disavow their own bodily presence while simultaneously remaining on hand when and if guests require their services. She describes the various strategies her respondents use to delete themselves. I'm quoting here. Janice admits to sneaking around quietly. Both Julia and Donna do not use the television if guests are in residence. Samantha and her partner predominantly stay in their bedroom. And then in more uh, extreme examples, respondents told Pennell of not flushing the toilet or showering, lest the unwelcome noise of running water give away the host's bodily presence. One of Pennell's respondents admits that she's not comfortable with these arrangements, but she worries about getting negative ratings, which Pennell interprets as a direct response to Airbnb's biopolitical messaging. Of course, not all Airbnb hosts are as diligently absent available as Pennell's respondents. Complaints about Airbnb from both hosts and guests are so common, they have a dedicated hashtag on social media, hashtag Airbnb bus. In these threads, Airbnb users lament the soulless feel of investor-owned listings or the fact that they have to clean up after themselves, or they complain that hosts are non-responsive, or even more common that the Airbnb helpline is non-responsive. There are many ways for hosts to abandon guests. Now, the figure of the absentee superhost takes Airbnb's biopolitical aspiration to its logical extreme, where guests are left to be hosted by, quote, disembodied hospitality entrepreneurs. I want to turn now to another figure who illustrates a different connotation of guests without hosts, and that is the mobile neighbor. Mobile neighboring is Suela Vela and Petra Fallon's solution for a world in which dwelling alongside with unknown people with unknown habits will be the unavoidable condition of future mobilities. They argue that this future calls for an alternative approach to architectural design, one that is not pre-scripted by the commercial playbook, but that leaves open the potential for creative, emergent, and responsible encounters between tourists. Disillusioned by the narrow economic model of hotels, where tourists are quantified in terms of bed nights and tourist accommodation is mere storage out of sight overnight, as they put it, Bela and Fallon propose a design ethos that imagines tourists not merely as consumers, but as mobile neighbors, who are free to stay and free to go, free but not obliged to care for and be cared for by others, and free to pursue a good life, not necessarily in economic terms, but in social and ethical terms. What they're suggesting sounds like a kind of biopolitics in which tourist life and embodied nearbyness between strangers is shaped, nudged, and supported by architectural, if not necessarily algorithmic design. Vail and Fallon argue that mobile neighboring is similar to, but departs from Derrida's notion of absolute hospitality. As Derrida conceives it, absolute hospitality entails the unconditional welcome of the unknown and potentially dangerous guest. But as Derrida also tells us, this absolute hospitality is a paradox, an aporia, in that it requires the host to simultaneously assert and relinquish the sovereignty required to welcome a guest into the host's home in the first place. 
For Viola and Fallon, however, mobile neighboring, quote, travels lighter than absolute hospitality, end quote, since there is no guest knocking on the host's door, but rather a mobile neighbor dwelling nearby. So rather than compelling a specific hospitality response, you know, that kickstarts that whole crisis and violence of sovereignty, mobile neighboring opens up an ethical space for encountering a stranger unburdened by the host at home and guest away from home, dualism and hierarchy. And that's a quote from Petra, uh, from Deola and Fallon. Mobile neighboring unravels the host guest hierarchies that underpin Derrida's aporia of absolute hospitality. And it moves us toward what Soila Veola, this time writing with Ava Jokinen, called the quote, post host guest society. Now this view of guests without hosts, this is a bit closer to my initial, maybe more idealistic thinking about network hospitality. My ethnographic fieldwork with couch surfers at the time revealed how those hospitality encounters blurred the distinctions between hosts and guests in a number of ways. In couch surfers' homes, I observed guests and hosts all hosting each other through caring acts like cooking meals for each other, for example. And then many of the couch surfers I interviewed, they were hosting guests in places where they themselves were guests. They were exchange students, expats, immigrants, subletters, and digital nomads who happened to have a spare couch to offer. One respondent I interviewed was part of an artist colony living in the reclaimed ruins of an Italian village that had been destroyed in an earthquake in the late 1800s. And then in the 1960s, this group of artists moved in and they made the ruins habitable, um, but without running water or electricity or permission to live there. Ever since, the village's residents have been under constant threat of eviction. My respondent and his girlfriend were hosting couch surfers in these ruins where they themselves were precarious dwellers, uh, primarily because they saw hosting as aligned with their um, broader anti-capitalist, anti-consumerist values. Now, the irony is not lost on me that couch surfing and Airbnb held the potential for the kind of mobile neighboring Veola and Fallon imagine. Early on, Airbnb's peer-to-peer -peer network model was hailed for disrupting the hospitality industry's conventional like hotel rooms, bed nights paradigm. And couch serving used to be free altogether, but Airbnb has turned out to be a very bad neighbor indeed. Areas rife with short-term rentals are experiencing the ill effects of buy-to-let gentrification, rising home prices, and housing shortages, which means residents are priced out of their own neighborhoods. So neighborhoods are depleted of the very local life guests hope to experience because only guests, not hosts, can afford to stay there. This is one version of mobile neighboring, but as I thought about Vela and Fallon's concept through a biopolitical lens, I was reminded of other examples where mobile dwelling with its potential for living otherwise becomes a form of resistance against coercive biopolitics. Some of these examples are detailed in Amitav Ghosh's book, the, Nutmeg, the Nutmeg's Curse, in which he aligns different forms of dwelling with traditions of resistance against racial and colonial capitalism. He points to Gandhi's ashrams, Occupy Wall Street, and the protest encampment at Standing Rock, where he writes, the temporary dwelling arrangements were a way for participants to reconnect with ancestral ways of inhabiting a landscape without building permanent structures. This brings me to my, my concluding um, thoughts on open source life. Amitav Ghosh introduces those examples of what I would consider mobile neighboring in a chapter titled A Vitalist Politics. As Ghosh describes them, vitalist forms of protest are all about kinship with spirits of the land, they embrace the metaphysical, they nurture empathy and mutual dependence, and they experiment with alternative spaces of habitation and ways of living. What Ghosh seems to be describing with vitalist politics isn't so much power's hold over life, but rather life's hold over power. 
This thought prompted me to revisit Rosie Bredotti's work on vital materialism, which in turn led me to a chapter she wrote on post-human affirmative biopolitics. In that piece, Bredotti critiques the Foucauldian premise that biopolitics controls and negates bios, human life. For her, this thread of biopolitical analysis focuses too narrowly on human life, on the dehumanizing state of bare life, or on the inhumane effects of governmentality in advanced capitalism. Instead, um, and she, she says that this is actually a myopic way of asking about the limits of what we call life. And instead, she appeals to a biopolitics in which life is defined as Zoe, a dynamic and generative non-human force that opens up alternative ways of living toward multiple complex ecologies of human and non-human others. Now, as my examples of the absentee superhost and the mobile neighbor suggest, the digital biopolitics of network hospitality can erase hosts by closing down possibilities, but also by opening up new possibilities for living together, or at least nearby on the move. I'm not arguing that those alternative ways of living together will necessarily translate into more ethical, equitable, or viable solutions for a happy future, but I am arguing that a biopolitics that is open to the complex, vital, unpredictable, untidy, and messy awkwardness of human and non-human togetherness is a better bet for future hospitalities than a coercive biopolitics whose dial is set to stifle alternative possibilities or to algorithmically winnow them down. So where does that leave algorithmic governance? Algorithms are by definition deciding machines, their conclusions are foregone. So can algorithms and platforms also be part of a vitalist politics? Can they coexist with an affirmative digital biopolitics? Well, perhaps they can if they are left unfinished and open. In his chapter on gig economy workers, Tim Christian's parting thought is that we should reimagine platforms, not as proprietary codes, but as open objects that are designed, but infinitely revisable through the creative self-organization of their users. He advocates for open platforms that are operated by workers rather than corporations, um, for open source algorithms and for like worker made apps where workers can um, organize their own labor. And this might be like awkward and, and glitchy or they might be great. And the same approach is possible in network hospitality. In recent years, users disillusioned by the platform capitalism of Airbnb and Couchsurfing has spun off to create free alternative open source sites such as bewelcome.org, trustroots.org, and couchers.org. And another example um, is Fairbnb, a cooperative platform that promotes itself as a non-extractive and sustainable alternative to Airbnb. When I think of affirmative, affirmative digital biopolitics, I do not imagine the algorithmic governance of actual ethical relations but rather a digital wedge that keeps the door open. And through that door are many ways of living together, including if we so choose more ethical ones.